And as I mentioned to Mick, once we're done between Portugal and Uruguay, that will be the halfway stage of the World Cup. The games are flying by. Very happy to bring in Mr. Kevin Kilban. Hello. Hi, Joseph. How's it going? It sounds like you're somewhere odd. Yeah, somewhere odd. I'm, I'm, I'm actually at the metro station. I misjudged getting back. I just went to watch the Brazil game this evening and I misjudged getting back to the hotel. I, I sat around for a cup of tea after the match with Dan McDonald. Oh, yeah. So we were catching up and, you know, having a, a chat. So I kind of left it so the crowd would clear. I'd be able to get back to the hotel, no problem, and I'd be able to get online with you guys. It's not worked out that way because it's still chaos and... The, the, the metro station here is chaos at the moment, yeah. OK. I did tell the lads when they said Kevin Kilban was going to be on live that that was a bad idea, but here we are. No, it, it always seems to be for you. and I've been fine, no issues at all. But when, when I get on with you, something seems to happen. It's like there's something up above that's putting uh, demons, demons between us, Joe. I don't know what it is. I'm hearing the metro is very, very good. Yeah, it's, it's really good system. The stadium here, I went to, um, what is it, Stadium 974. This is where the Brazil game was this evening. Okay. It's not actually too far from the hotel. It's probably three stops down the metro, off on the metro. And once, once I actually got off, the problem is you've got about a mile, maybe a mile and a half walk. It's a good half an hour walk probably from the metro station to the ground itself once you get off. And it sounds like it's still very lively there. So are these Brazilian fans, uh, Swiss fans? Brazilian, would be? Yeah. yeah, Brazilian. Well, probably about five seconds before it came on, it was just absolute chaos. It was carnage getting through the, the metro station. So I kind of sat down here, sat down there, and all the fans were just streaming through. If I turn the camera around, there's still a few floating around over there. You can probably hear a little bit. Okay. So they were all like streaming through the, through the metro station here, getting obviously heading down to, to get on the train wherever they're heading to. But it is, yeah, it's all Brazil. All Brazil. I've not really seen any Switzerland fans since I got here, as it turns out. But there's a lot of... Um, a lot of, uh, of Brazil fans everywhere, yeah. Well, it doesn't seem like European fans have travelled in great numbers is what we're hearing. Argentina seemed to have brought a huge fan base and even Mexico the other night yeah. had as well. And Brazil will be well supported, I would presume, even by locals, if not necessarily all uh, from Brazil. Yeah, I'd probably say that's fair. There's a lot of local support here for Brazil. Probably, I, I, I think from what I've seen, Morocco is probably the, the most uh, or best supported team here I, from what I've seen. Thousands and thousands of Moroccan fans everywhere I go. But Argentina, you're right. When I probably landed in Doha, what, 10 days or so ago now, whenever it was, Argentine, Argentina fans everywhere, all over the airport. And that's been continued since I got here. Outside Morocco, I probably think that the Argentine is the best supported team here, yeah. OK. So it's good to hear a bit of atmosphere because one of the other things I'd read, and I don't, don't know what your sense is, and I do appreciate it can be hard when you're uh, working for media at games, you're often there early or leaving late, is that... I've been hearing the atmosphere isn't amazing, that it's been a slightly quiet World Cup by comparison with others. What's your sense of the general atmosphere around Doha, around the games, day to day? Day, day to day, where our studio is, um, uh, in the soup where we are, it's kind of like the, the, the central shopping mall, whatever you would say, in the, in the centre of Doha, there's... There's, there's a real buzz there. There is, as I said, Moroccan, Argentine, or Mexican, whatever. There's loads of different nationalities, loads of fans around there. But it's the first game first game I've gone to and sat there tonight. And, you know, usually whenever I've been to a Brazil game in the past, the atmosphere is just electric, you know, so loud. It, it, it didn't seem like that tonight somehow, even for a Brazil game. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit crazy here in the Metro and it's, it's madness around the place, maybe going into the stadium before the game and afterwards. But... In the stadium itself tonight, it didn't seem like a normal Brazil match at a World Cup whenever I've been to them before. So, yeah, I'd maybe take that. I, I've not really got too much experience. I, I've, I've only been to the two of the other Canadian games, actually. When I went to the Canada games, there's great atmosphere. A lot, of, a lot of Canada fans have come over. So, I've noticed great atmosphere at, at those games, but maybe a little bit less or not necessarily as, as, as loud as other games that I would have been to in the past. I think, I think that's fair to say. It's probably better off. Dan mentioned the same thing to me tonight. He's been to a lot of games. I think Dan said he's been to 10, 11 matches since he's got here. Uh, and he was saying something similar to what you're saying there, Joe. A lot of the atmosphere is atmosphere of the games. It's not normally, or it's not like a normal World Cup, World Cup, World Cup match. 
Um, I'm sorry, so you mentioned the Canadian games. You're obviously working on Canadian television. I, I forgive me if I'm stepping on something that's a very serious issue, but on Twitter, the Paul Pesci Salido uh, spat obviously uh, caught people's eye. So he's not impressed that there are uh, non-Canadians on the Canadian coverage. Is that right? Are you like the Diddy a man here? And he said, "Out you go." Yeah, absolutely like Diddy a man here. Yeah, uh, I was surprised as a teammate of Paul Pesci Salido when I was at West Brom. We were at West Brom together, so. Yeah, I kind of, yeah, I, of course I was a bit peed off with it when he, when he sent the message out because it's actually not true. Four of our six guys have played or are current players for, for Canada. One's the second uh, record cap holder. And we actually have Stephen Caldwell, who up until about a year, 18 months ago, was a coach on the, on the Canadian team. So I think the panel that we have is very relevant. The only one he could single out from that is essentially me. So I felt as though it was very harsh on, on Pesh when he's coming for me like that, particularly when, you know, I played alongside Pesh and there was at times when he was called up to play for Canada, he, he didn't want to go back and play for them at times. So I was kind of a bit bemused by what he was actually saying to me, to be quite honest with you. OK, I didn't realise that. To be fair, I wouldn't have even known about it unless I'd seen your replies. I presume it's all much ado yeah, about nothing exactly. or has it been a talking point yeah, in the Canadian yeah. media? I don't know. I might have been. I don't know. I'm not really paying attention to it. I was just a bit, as I said, I was a bit peed that he sent those. So I, I, I felt as though I had to maybe defend the panel because it was untrue what he was saying anyway. There was no Canadian players or ex-players on the panel, which was untrue. And also the fact was that he was actually coming for me in a way to say that, first of all, he said I was British, which, as we well know, I'm not. That was probably so you the took that well, did you? Given me, Joe, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was, that was great for my mentality, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, again, I, I, I just had, I felt as though I had to maybe respond to it. Um, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have just let it go, but... I actually saw Ronnie Whelan there tonight at the game as well. And Ronnie actually said the same to me. He said, oh, I see you've been having a bit of a pop. And he said, really, is it, is it, is it getting it? He goes, oh, I read all about it too in, 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 online or something. I said, gee, I, I haven't even realised it's actually gone online. It's become a thing, actually. Well, this is the issue with Twitter. If you had said nothing back, nobody would know a thing about this. But I know. I I'm, I'm attention-seeking, Joe. I no, think that's probably what well, it is. You're no? entitled to have a bite back if you're defending yourself. As well, I suppose. Yeah, uh, what, what, what? I, 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 felt, I felt I was right anyway. Yeah, well, I didn't even realise he was a former teammate, so that would add to your ire a touch as well. Yeah, exactly. That's my point. Exactly was, yeah. that's When, when he comes out with that, I'm, hang on a minute, you know. Uh, anyway, I've, I, I, I've said my piece. Yes, and we'll move on. I, and I suppose, it's probably, I suppose it's not necessarily the platform to say your piece because everything can kind of get taken out of context from what you're, what you're saying anyway, but... I, it was totally false and totally untrue with what he was actually saying. So I just felt as though it was a bit of BS what he was saying. So anyway, there you go. Yes, fair enough. Um, have you yeah. uh, often a chance to reinvent yourself when you um, move away? So on this uh, Canadian panel, what role have you assumed? Are you the hard-hitting outsider who gives a clear-eyed view on how terrible Canada are? What do you do? Uh, I was actually quite positive going into the Croatia game, actually. I was really positive, more so than I was maybe a couple of weeks ago when we'd done a few panel hits and things like that. A couple of weeks ago, we had to do, um, you know, like a World Cup preview show, best best teams in the World Cup and all this sort of thing. I was actually a little bit more critical of them then, saying I, I really don't give them too much hope against Belgium and uh, Croatia. And you know, when you're, when you're around it a little bit more, you get a little bit more of a feeling of, yeah, I, I can't seem to get something. And I thought they would have scored actually against Belgium. I, I fancied them to score a goal at the very least started so well should have got something I thought they played really well and that maybe raised expectations maybe in my own head that they could have replicated that that, that sort of performance in, in the Croatia match but they didn't play well certainly after the first 15, uh, 10 or 15 minutes I thought Croatia just worked them out to play a four-man midfield like two two centrally against Croatia who have the best midfield in the tournament I just felt as though I, I, I thought there was tactically a lot wrong with how Canada set up in the game and they, they were just totally outplayed and dominated, particularly Kovacic. He was simply outstanding. Um, and it, uh, Perisic as well was another one that was outstanding. They, they, they just outclassed them. They had too much for them. The experience, the class and everything, you know, and tactically as well. They just, they were just, they just dominated Canada. So, as I said, I was a bit more positive going into that uh, Croatian game than I probably was going into the Belgian game. But after that Belgian performance, I think it, it lifted everyone and gave us a bit of hope. But anyway... Um, I think the reality they've really come back down to earth anywhere now after that Croatia game Not since Euro 2012 Ireland-Spain has a two-man midfield been thrown to the wolves like that it's, uh... 
It was very similar, Joe. Yeah. Did you watch, did you watch the match? It, it did, yeah. Now, to be fair, I wasn't paying too much attention to Canada. I was just marvelling at Croatia, who are like the best over 35s Astro team of all time, you know? That's kind of their vibe. Oh, it is, it's true, isn't it? I mean, you, you watch the midfield three, Joe. I just think, you know, you're always... I know that Luka Modric is probably the greatest thing that has ever, ever lived for you. But did you you watch them at times? We, I, we were trying to do a little bit of analysis on them post-game. The positions that they take up, the, you know, the, the movement of going from a two to a one, two sitters, and Modric sometimes is a ten. Then we'll come to... Modric sometimes comes as a, as a six, and you'll have Rozovic that will go as a ten. And they play so close to each other at times as well. They've got the, the utmost belief in their ability that, as you say, almost like a five-a-side game. We'll keep the ball from you. You'll never get anywhere near us. And they go in, they, 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 they go in certain sections of the field. Sometimes they'll go over to they'll take a short corner as a three. And they'll just keep the ball and pass it around in the corner, leaving themselves open, you know. They're not very quick at the back. They've not really got an awful lot of pace throughout the team, really. But those three players particularly are just... Incredible, they're yeah. incredible to watch like yeah. that. And now, the, as I said, the movement, the positions that they take up, and the chances they create—they were, they were, they were incredible to watch again yesterday. I mean, it did. It actually felt like the Spain game to me in yeah. Euro 2012 when we, when we watched that game and watching um, Iniesta, how good he was in that game. And you know, I'm sure that you can make a comparison with, with all three of the Spanish mid, uh, midfielders at that time. But it was a, a two-man mid, midfield playing against that. That three was just crazy. It was crazy. And he tried to change it at half time, but I, it almost felt the game was over at that stage. And they were just, they were just incredible Croatia. Incredible performance from them, really. Are you going to many games, or are you doing everything from a studio? Uh, just the three Canada games. Um, so we, we actually have a great spot. We, we normally in one of the corners. We'll, we'll set up on a platform. We have a great vantage points to see the game, and so that's what we're doing. Everything else is the studio, so right, okay. we'll be in the studio local time here, usually about uh, 12 30, 1 o'clock, or something like that. Who've been the best team you've seen so far? Because it feels quite open. Yeah, it does. Um, Brazil were quite flat tonight. I don't know if you watched the game. They, they seem to have gained momentum, certainly in the, in the Serbia match as the game went on. The last 20 minutes against Serbia was the Brazil that you watch. Brazil sitting there in there. I heard, I heard Tim Vickery, I think he was on with you a couple of weeks ago, John, where he was talking about whether it was going to be Vinicius Jr. or play Fred, which seemed crazy to us at, at the time. That, that wasn't the case to me from the Brazil that I've seen. It, they, they line up as a 4-3-3. Neymar plays as an eight, essentially, along uh, on the same side as Vinicius Jr. So they'll have two real attacking players down the left and they just let those two go. And the rest of the guys just kind of sit in behind them the back four is invariably always intact. Casemiro usually sit in front of them, and it's like we've got five defenders. You've gone, you five go and win us the game. That's how Brazil seems to play. So I'll be interested to see what Brazil do against a real top class side. France have probably looked the most impressive side, and Bappe's looked sensational in the games oh, that I yeah. that I've seen. Uh, just he's a cut above. I mean, I don't know what anyone would think. I, I think he's the best in the world right now. I think he's getting better and better. He's, his overall game's improving. I was listening to Brian Kerr talking uh, talking with you, was it today, Joe, or yesterday? I, I saw the footage of it where he was talking about the time he used to go and watch George Best, and you're wanting, you're waiting for something to happen, and something invariably does happen when when Mbappe's in the game. So I love watching him. I think France have certainly looked the best side. They look good at the back, making the change of taking um, Pavard out and putting Koundé in at right back. They look even stronger actually now. France they look good at the back, good in midfield. So but up front, Dembele's been excellent for them as well with Pichiru and, um, and France so I think probably the best side I've seen have been France they've, they've looked the most impressive I'd feel yeah Okay if anyone's just tuning in and we're talking to Kevin Kilban he's in Qatar he's at a metro station he told us he'd be in a quiet room for a broadcasting conversation but instead he uh, I'm, trying to, to bring the, I'm trying to bring the colour to you John. No, I'm trying to true. bring a bit of life to it you know? it's kind of working you know it's kind of working so yeah, just about. Just about. We can hear you okay. On England then, all they're playing tomorrow. All the talk is about Phil Foden not in their starting eleven. What's your read on this situation here? Uh, well, I, I can't believe it. I thought it before the first game against Iran. I, I, I couldn't believe that he, he's not playing essentially his best player. I think I think Foden is the best player. And I think the USA game as well. I, I, I was on with a few of the guys. I think it was on AM. I mean, we did a little bit on the US. The US don't create an awful lot of chances, a lot of energy in the team. I mentioned Tyler Adams, who I really rate highly. Moose is another good player uh, from Valencia in midfield. Um, but up front, I think I think the lack in the lack in a number nine, and Pulisic is a player that I don't know. There's something about him, Joe, in my eyes. I just don't I don't see it with Pulisic. 
I think he does a lot. He works really hard, gets himself in good positions, but just doesn't do enough with his final ball or his or his end his end game doesn't really match with a lot a lot more of his game. So I think you kind of knew that was how the USA were going to play against him. You attack them in wide areas. How do you attack them? You attack them with good high fullbacks. And Trent Alexander Arnold was the ideal player for that game. I know he doesn't fancy him, but he seemed to me like he, he, he would always be an outball for England. They, they blocked off Declan Rice. I was really impressed with, with how USA stopped Rice getting on the ball. They stopped Bellingham. Uh, and they stopped Mount as well. I thought Mount actually played well in the Iran game. He almost set the tone for England in that match. So as soon as you're blocking out the midfield, what do you do? You've got to, you've got to, you've got to work it into wide areas. And England didn't really do that. Trippier didn't play well. He's nowhere near as good. He's not in the same class as Trent Alexander-Arnold going forward. So I, I couldn't believe he didn't start him. And going back to the folding issue, it looked like the game was crying out for, for, the, for a player of his type after 45 minutes in the USA game. I, I, I don't understand it. So I think it's always going to come back to Southgate. I, I felt with the Euros, he was actually quite negative. I remember even talking to you after that Euro final about how Italy worked England out in that final during the game. First 15 minutes of the match, England in front playing well. And they kind of worked out how to play against Harry Kane, worked out how to play against England. I should have won it probably in the 120 minutes. But England didn't deserve to win the Euros. And I get the feeling that's going to be the same way for England here. It's, it's almost like a, a little bit of a negative approach. OK, OK, interesting. Uh, i got to go, you got to go. Are you, are you going out for a drink of an evening or what's the general approach there? Is it all very difficult? It's quiet enough, actually. Went out for a bit of dinner after the game last night. Now, fairly low-key, which... As I say, we're only getting off, off early at 12.30 a.m., 1 a.m. By the time you're going, getting back to the hotel, you know, everything seems to be shut at the hotel when we're getting back in. So it's really, it's really low-key in that respect, really, okay. yeah. So trying to get us, trying to, trying to catch up on my sleep, Joel, to be honest Fair with you. Enough. So the odds of us seeing you doing a nice ice baby on camera somewhere are slim. Is that what I'm hearing? Not that kind of vibe. <laughs> 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 I don't well, know. Well, that's a pity. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe one day. I don't know, I don't know. Maybe one of the days, I don't All know. Right. Uh, good to talk to you. Enjoy yeah. it. Take care. All right, Joel. Thanks a lot. See Cheers. you. Chemical Ban, live from a metro. The glamour of that. Imagine, live from a metro in Qatar. Our football show coverage brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. Pat Nevin's going to be with us later on in the football show, as is Tim Vickery. We have uh, Keith Wood and Jerry Thornley on the way very shortly as well.